June 5th, 1832. Part 1. Of what is the immute composed? Of nothing and of everything. Of an electricity gradually evolved. Of a flame suddenly leaping forth. Of a wandering force. Of a passing wind. This wind meets talking tongues. Dreaming brains. Suffering souls. Burning passions. Howling miseries and sweeps them away. Whether? At hazard. Across the state. Across the laws. Across the prosperity and the insolence of others. Irritated convictions. Eager enthusiasms. Excited indignations. The repressed instincts of war. Exalted young courage. Noble impulses. Curiosity. The taste for change. The thirst for the unexpected. That sentiment which gives us pleasure in reading the bill of a new play, and which makes the ringing of the prompter's bell at the theatre a welcome sound. Vague hatred, spites, disappointments, every vanity which believes that destiny has caused it to fail, discomforts, empty dreams, ambitions shut in by high walls. Whoever hopes for an issue from a downfall, finally, at the very bottom, the mob. That mud which takes fire. Such are the elements of the immute. Whatever is greatest, and whatever is most infamous, the beings who prowl about outside of everything, awaiting an opportunity, bohemians, people without occupation, loafers about the street corners, those who sleep at night in a desert of houses, with no other roof than the cold clouds of the sky, those that ask their bread each day from chance, and not from labour, the unknown ones of misery and nothingness, the bare arms, the bare feet, belong to the immute. Whoever feels in his soul a secret revolt at any act whatever of the state, of life, or of fate, borders on the immute, and as soon as it appears, begins to shiver and to feel himself uplifted by the whirlwind. The immute is a sort of water spout in the social atmosphere, which suddenly takes form in certain conditions of temperature, and which, in its whirling, mounts, runs, thunders, tears up, raises, crushes, demolishes, uproots, dragging with it the grand natures and the poultry the strong man and the feeble mind, the trunk of the tree and the blade of straw. Woe to him whom it sweeps away, as well as to him whom it comes to smite. It breaks them one against the other. In the spring of 1832, although for three months the cholera had chilled all hearts and had thrown over their agitation an inexpressibly mournful calm, Paris had for a long time been ready for a commotion. As we have said, the great city resembles a piece of artillery. When it is loaded, the falling of a spark is enough. The shot goes off. In June 1832, the spark was the death of General Lamarck. Lamarck was a man of renown and action. He had successively, under the Empire and under the Restoration, the two braveries necess necessary to the two epochs, the bravery of the battlefield and the bravery of the rostrum. He was eloquent as he had been valiant. Men felt a sword in his speech. Like Foy, his predecessor, after having upheld command, he upheld liberty. He sat between the left and the extreme left, loved by the people because he accepted the chances of the future, loved by the masses because he had served the emperor well. He hated Wellington, with a direct hatred which pleased the multitude, and for 17 years, hardly noticing intermediate events, he had majestically persevered the sadness of Waterloo. In his death agony, at his latest hour, he had pressed against his breast a sword which was presented to him by the officers of the Hundred Days. Napoleon died pronouncing the word armée, Lamarck pronouncing the word patrie. His death, which had been looked for, was dreaded by the people as a loss, and by the government as an opportunity. This death was a mourning. Like everything which is bitter, mourning may turn into revolt. This is what happened. On the 5th of June, then, a day of mingled rain and sunshine, the procession of General Lamarck passed through Paris with the official military pomp somewhat increased by way of precaution. Two battalions, drums muffled, muskets reversed, 10,000 National Guards, their sabres at their sides. The batteries of the artillery of the National Guard escorted the coffin. The hearse was drawn by young men. The officers of the Invalides followed immediately, bearing branches of laurel. Then came countless multitude, strange and agitated, the sectionaries of the Friends of the People, the Law School, the Medical School, Refugees from all nations, Spanish, Italian, German, Polish flags, horizontal tricolored flags, every possible banner, children waving green branches, stone cutters and carpenters who were on strike at that very moment, printers recognizable by their paper caps, walking two by two, three by three, uttering cries, almost all brandishing clubs, a few swords without order, and yet with a single soul, now a route, now a column. Some platoons chose chiefs, 
A man, armed with a pair of pistols openly worn, seemed to be passing others in review as they filed off before him. On the cross alleys of the boulevards, in the branches of the trees, on the balconies at the windows, on the roofs, were swarms of heads, men, women, children. Their eyes were full of anxiety. An armed multitude was passing by. A terrified multitude was looking on. The government was also observing. It was observing with its hand upon the hilt of the sword. One might have seen, all ready to march, with full cartridge boxes, guns and musketoons loaded, in the Place Louis XV, four squadrons of carboneers, in the saddle, trumpets at their heads, in the Latin Quarter and at the Jardin de Plantes, the municipal guard, on echelon from street to street, at the Hall Auvin, a squadron of dragoons, at Le Grève, one half of the Twelfth Light, the other half at the Bastille, the Sixth Dragoons at the Celestin, the Court of Louvre, full of artillery. The rest of the troops were stationed in the barracks, without counting the regiments in the environs of Paris. Anxious authority held suspended over the threatening multitude, 24,000 soldiers in the city, and 30,000 in the Bamieux. Diverse rumours circulated in the cortege. They talked of legitimatist, legitimatist intrigues. They talked of the Duke of the Reichstadt, whom God was marking for dead at that very moment when the populace was designated him for empire. A personage, still unknown, announced that at the appointed hour, two foremen, who had been won over, would open to the people the doors of a manufactory of arms. The dominant expression on the uncovered foreheads of most of these present was one of subdued enthusiasm. Here and there in the multitude, a prey to so many violent but noble emotions, could also be seen some genuine faces of malefactors and ignoble mouths which said pillage. There are certain agitations which stir up the bottom of the marsh, and which make, which make clouds of mud rise in the water, a phenomenon to which well-regulated police are not strangers. The cortege made its way, with a feverish slow slowness, from the house of death along the boulevards as far as the Bastille. It rained from time to time, the rain had no effect upon that throng. The hearse passed the Bastille, followed the canal, crossed the little bridge, then reached the esplanade of the bridge of Austerlitz. There it stopped. At this moment, a bird's eye view of this multitude would have presented the appearance of a comet, the head of which was the esplanade, while the tail spreading over the Quai Bourdon covered the Bastille and stretched along the boulevard as far as the Port of Saint Martin. A circle was formed about the hearse. The vast assemblage became silent. Lafayette spoke and bowed farewell to Lamarck. It was a touching and august moment. All heads were uncovered, all hearts throbbed. Suddenly, a man on horseback, dressed in black, appeared in the midst of the throng with a red flag, others say with a pike surmounted by a red cap. Lafayette turned away his head. Exalma left the cortege. This red flag raised a storm and disappeared in it. From the boulevard Baudin to the bridge of Austerlitz, one of those shouts which resembled billows moved to the multitude. Two prodigious shouts arose, Lamarck to the Pantheon, Lafayette to the Hotel de Ville. Some young men, amidst the cheers of the throng, harnessed themselves and began to draw Lamarck in the hearse over the bridge of Austerlitz, and Lafayette in a fiacre along the Quai Morland. In the crowd which surrounded and cheered Lafayette was noticed and pointed out a German named Ludwig Sarnider, who afterward died a centenarian, who had been in the War of 1776, and who had fought at Trenton under Washington, and under Lafayette at Brandywine. Meanwhile, on the left bank, the municipal cavalry was in motion, and had just barred the bridge. On the right bank, the dragoons left the Celestin and deployed along the quay, Morland. The men who were drawing Lafayette suddenly perceived them at the corner of the quay and cried, The dragoons! The dragoons were advancing at a walk, in silence, their pistols in their holsters, their sabres in their sheaths, their musketoons in their rests, with an air of gloomy expectation. At two hundred paces from the little bridge, they halted. The fiacre in which Lafayette was made its way up to them. They opened their ranks, let it pass, and close again behind it. At that moment, the dragoons and the multitude came together. The women fled in terror. What took place in that fatal moment? Nobody could tell. It was a dark moment when two clouds mingle. Some say that a trumpet flourish sounding the charge was heard from the direction of the arsenal. Others that a dagger thrust was given by a child to a dragoon. The fact is that three shots were suddenly fired. The first killed the chief of the squadron, Cholet. The second killed an old deaf woman who was closing her window in the Rue Contrescarp. The third singed the epaulet of an officer. A woman cried, They're beginning too soon! And all at once there was seen, 
from the side opposite the Kimolland, a squadron of dragoons which had remained in the barracks turning out on the gallop, with swords drawn, from the Rue Bassompierre and the Boulevard Bourdon, and sweeping all before them. There are no more words. The tempest breaks loose. Stones fall like hail. Musketry bursts forth. Many rush headlong down the bank and cross the little arm of the Seine, now filled up, the yards of the Ile Louvier, that ready-made citadel, bristle with combatants. They tear up stakes, they fire pistol shots. A barricade is planned out. The young men crowded back past the bridge of Austerlitz, with the hearse at a run, and a charge, and the municipal guard. The carboneers rush up, the dragoons ply the sabre, the mass scatters in every direction. A rumour of war flies to the four corners of Paris. Men cry, to arms! They run, they tumble, they fly, they resist. Ruff sweeps along the immute as the wind sweeps along a fire. Part 2 Nothing is more extraordinary than the first swarming of an immute. Everything bursts out everywhere at once. Was it foreseen? Yes. Was it prepared? No. Whence does it spring? From the pavements. Whence does it fall? From the clouds. Here the insurrection has the character of a plot, there of an inspiration. The first comer takes possession of a current of the multitude and leads it whither he will, a beginning full of terror which is mingled with a sort of frightful gaiety. At first there are clamours, the shops close, the displays of the merchants disappear, then some isolated shots. People flee, butts of guns strike against porte cochere. You hear the servant girls laughing in the yards of the houses and saying, there's going to be a row. A quarter of an hour had not elapsed, and here is what had taken place nearly at the same time in twenty different points in Paris. Right bank, left bank, on the quays, on the boulevards, in the Latin Quarter, in the region of the markets. Breathless men, working men, students, sectionaries, read proclamations, cried to arms, broke the street lamps, unharnessed wagons, tore up the pavements, broke in the doors of the houses, uprooted the trees, ransacked the cellars, rolled hogsheads, heaped up paving stones, pebbles, pieces of furniture, boards, made barricades. What had really assumed the direction of the immute was a sort of unknown impetuosity, in which was the, map, the atmosphere. The insurrection abruptly had built the barricades with one hand, and with the other seized nearly all the posts of the garrison. In less than three hours, like a train of powder which takes fire, the insurgents had invaded and occupied on the right bank the arsenal, the mayor's office of the Place Royale, all the marais, the popping court, manufactory of arms, the galiot, the chateau d'eau, all the streets near the markets on the left bank, the barracks of the veterans, Sainte Palogie, the Place Maubert, the powder mill of the Deux Milan, all the barrières. At five o'clock in the afternoon, there were masters of the Bastille, the Langerie, the Blanc Manteau. Their scouts touched the Place de Victoire and threatened the bank. The barracks of the Petit Père and the Hôtel de Poste, a third of Paris was in the immute. At all points, the struggle had commenced on a gigantic scale, and from the disarmings, from the domiciliary visits, from the armorous shops hastily invaded, there was, by this result, that the combat which was commenced by throwing stones was continued by throwing cannonballs. About six o'clock in the afternoon, the Arcade de saint saëns became a field of battle. The Amute was at one end, the troops at the end opposite. They fired from one, from one grating to the other. An observer, a dreamer, the author of this book, who had gone to get a near view of the volcano, found himself caught in the arcade between the two fires. He had nothing but the projection of the pilasters which separate the shops to protect him from the balls. He was nearly half an hour in this delicate situation. Meanwhile, the drums beat the long roll. The National Guards dressed and armed themselves in haste. The legions left the Meret, the regiments left their barracks. The insurrection had made the centre of Paris a sort of inextricable, tortuous, colossal citadel. There was the focus. There was evidently the question. All the rest were only skirmishes. What proved that there all would be decided was that they were not yet fighting there. In some regiments, the soldiers were doubtful, which added to the frightful obscurity of the crisis. They remembered the popular ovation which in July 1830 had greeted the neutrality of the 53rd of the line. Two intrepid men, who had been proved by the great wars, Marshal de Lubeau and General Lugo, commanded. Lugo under Lobeau. Enormous patrols, com composed of battalions of the line, surrounded by the entire companies of the National Guard and preceded by a commissary of police with his badge, went out, reconnoitring the insurgent streets. On their side, the insurgents placed pickets at the corners of the streets and boldly sent patrols outside the barricades. 
They kept watch on both sides. The government, with an army in its hand, hesitated. Night was coming on, and the tocsin of Saint Mary began to be heard. The Minister of War of the time, Marshal Sou, who had seen Austerlitz, beheld this with gloomy countenance. These old so sailors, accustomed to correct manoeuvring and having no resource or guide save tactics, that company of battles, are completely lost in the presence of that immense foam, which is called the wrath of the people. The wind of revolutions is not tractable. Solitude reigned at the Tuileries. Louis-Philippe was full of serenity. <laughs>